Flywheel energy storage systems have been in use for centuries. The earliest cars had flywheels, 1885. But before that, in 1807, the first steam-powered paddle-wheel boat was constructed only three years after the 1804 creation of the first steam locomotives, both of which used flywheels. Flywheels help to smooth out the power delivery of a reciprocating engine turning that back and forth motion into smooth rotational energy for the paddles or wheels. Far earlier, back in 650 CE, were mills of all sorts to grind grain and pump water. Whether driven by water or wind, they all relied on flywheels to store and release energy as needed. Even a potter's wheel is a good example. By definition, that is what a modern chemical battery does and is how most of us think of batteries. They store energy and release it upon demand. They're in all our smart devices, cars, and are even used for bulk power storage at wind farms and solar arrays, so we can have energy for the grid when the wind fades and the sun sets. Modern flywheels can store energy for surprisingly long periods, but they are not competitive with chemical batteries in that respect. Using common, everyday materials that aren't dangerous to the environment and which don't pose health risks, are cheap to obtain, manufacture, and to use still makes them very attractive. Could they one day replace lithium technology? Lithium ion batteries. The current favorite, no pun intended, is the lithium ion battery because it has very high power density compared to its mass. That is, evolving towards lithium polymer batteries because they have higher power density by weighing even less. The problem is that present-day lithium batteries use a lot of nickel and cobalt in their manufacture. By 2050, we will need to double our nickel production and quadruple our cobalt production to keep up with demand. Worse yet, experts have predicted that our available Earth-sourced lithium will be used up by 2080. The latest lithium tech has introduced lithium sulfur batteries that hold eight times more energy, cost less, and which we're not going to run out of in the foreseeable future. Scarcity, or simply the ability to mine enough for our needs, will likely make all the components, including lithium, more expensive. Improved recovery from expended battery technology may make the lithium problem vanish, but could flywheels still be competitive on a dollars per kilowatt basis? How do flywheels work? Imagine you have an upside down bicycle, wheels in the air, and you turn the pedals to make the drive wheel turn slowly. Could you stop that with your hand? Of course you could, because there is very little energy in the system. It is not advisable, of course, to get body parts near moving equipment. If it was turning as quickly as you could make it go, trying to stop it by hand will certainly result in an injury. The kinetic energy, the energy of motion, of a fast-moving tire, is at a much higher level and will decay over a longer period of time simply because there is more of it. This is because of its greater energy, capable of overcoming the friction of the system, the surrounding air, and the only moderately efficient bearings which allow the wheel to turn. Eventually, it will stop, since friction is virtually inevitable in any system. Two principles. Doing the same thing with a car's driving tire off the ground would be much harder, even at slow speeds. That is because there are two different principles at work here. The lighter bike wheel has most of its energy stored as velocity, the speed of rotation. While the automobile tire shares this principle, its energy is primarily stored as a result of rotating mass, which we call angular momentum. Car wheels mass about 25 kilograms per 55 pounds. Bicycle wheels mass about 1,000 grams per 2.2 pounds. That means car tires have 25 times the mass of bike tires and consequently have 25 times the ability to store energy. Flywheel battery storage. Originally, FES systems used contact bearings that required lubricants, maintenance, and regular replacement of parts as they wore down. Since then, we've advanced and now use devices and techniques like air bearings that force a layer of air between the parts so they don't actually touch. This eliminates lubricants. That's now the air's job. And wear on the system, no more replacement parts, and minimizes maintenance. 
Of course, there's still friction from the mass spinning through the surrounding air. By using so-called permanent magnets, we can suspend the spinning mass without the air bearings. That means we can create a vacuum in the container and eliminate even the friction of air. Some experimental models have achieved efficiencies in the low 90% range. How does the energy move? The spinning mass is more than just a lump of metal. It is actually a magnetic core with wire windings and magnets that can be sped up or slowed down when we manipulate the magnetic forces around it. It is essentially both a motor and a generator. We use the motor aspect to add electricity and speed it up, or store energy. We use the generator aspect to slow it down, or use energy for the system as electricity. Non-polluting and long-lived. In every aspect, it is a rechargeable battery, but it is almost useless for transportable energy. Something big enough to provide a decent amount of energy would have to spin extremely fast. That means if it ever failed, it would shed parts like shrapnel or bullets injuring or killing bystanders. For that reason, it needs to be armored to contain all the bits if it fails. Now, it's not only big and heavy, but it also possesses processing forces, just like a gyroscope. What that means is that it would be difficult to turn corners, tip, or even move the battery. In other words, it is ideally suited for a non-moving application. The bulk of a city power-sized mass should be made of concrete, utilizing steel, copper, iron, and other non-toxic components for something very large that spins relatively slowly. You would lose some of that energy to power a compressor to supply the air bearings, reducing overall efficiency, but it could be accomplished on a grand scale with existing technology and no new discoveries. For a small, local power-sized unit with a higher speed core, they could spin at tens of thousands of RPM in vacuum, even beyond the tensile strength of steel by incorporating carbon fiber Kevlar spectra or other exceptional engineering materials. You would still lose some efficiency to electrical resistance and electromagnetic external support for the rotor. The cores would also need their permanent magnets replaced eventually since, as was hinted at earlier, permanent magnets are not really permanent. Magnets that are heated, dropped, vibrated, impacted, or placed in opposition to another magnetic field will lose strength in their magnetic field over time. There would be maintenance required, but it might be decades between necessary permanent magnet changes. The cost per kilowatt hour. Right now, we can obtain cheap and fast power from natural gas-fired auxiliary power generators. They can be brought online quickly to handle large demand loads, the coal and nuclear generators cannot start and stop quickly, taking hours or days to change. So they run continuously and the auxiliary units manage the peak demands. This includes solar and wind generation, which are only available when the sun is up or a breeze is present, adding another degree of uncertainty. On the whole, the source doesn't matter, except for environmental concerns, of course. What will matter is the cost to store the energy and how readily it can be made available upon need. Lithium can provide instant compensation, as can pumped hydro storage systems, and even modern flow batteries, which are less expensive and take up a lot less space, are fast off the mark. Well, surprise! Flywheels can do the same thing, providing instant power when needed. However, can you see the problem with this chart of the cost of storage for power? Flywheel batteries are by far the most expensive method for storing power in terms of levelized costs, calculated over decades. Those costs drop down over the decades for all types, but everything else remains cheaper. Flywheels might be ideal in some areas, but the other technologies are cheaper based on current knowledge. In truth, our recent video on gravity batteries gives us a much better form of the mechanical battery that is cheaper to build and uses a lot less space. It's also non-polluting, uses virtually no toxic materials, has already been demonstrated and has attracted a lot of investment. Technological advances may change the outlook for flywheel batteries, but it seems that much sooner than ever before, we're looking at fusion energy becoming a reality. 
All of these current technologies may become obsolete as we attain essentially unlimited power with fusion energy. As we say in the science game, the only certainty is that things will change. Your best defense against change is to keep learning. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to check out our other video on gravity batteries. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.